AI. We're told that it's in virtually everything that we own. From our cell phones to our smartwatches, light bulbs, and televisions. And we're also often told that this should be very concerning to us. But what exactly is AI? I'm Leo Allen, and in this series from Voluntary Input, I speak with the experts, innovators, and thought leaders in AI about this very thing. Specifically, what exactly is AI? Who's building it? Who's in control of it? And most importantly, is it all truly evil? Never forced, never coerced. Open discussions about things in life that matter to you most. From tech to TV, movies, and gaming, and everything in between. Visit VoluntaryInput.com to subscribe, contact us, and find out how you can support the show. Catch new episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Voluntary Input. All right, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your busy day to come on the show. How are you doing? Thank you very much. How are you? Doing great, doing great. Um, I was reading through your bio and whatnot. Very, very interesting timeline of events. Uh, First of all, can you explain to everyone just a little bit about yourself, who you are, and why you're here? Uh, Sure. Yeah, uh, my drawback. I um, I'm an entrepreneur. My background is in AI. I have a PhD in AI, and I've done several startups in AI. I'm actually the CTO AI for Cognizant, uh, which is a huge company, not a startup, uh, at the moment. And uh, the reason I'm here is because I just recently published a book of stories based on my uh, my childhood and and youth and background, um, and uh, would like to promote it. And I think it has traces of why. Why and how I became uh, a serial entrepreneur and, and uh, excited and, and interested in AI as well. So hopefully your audience is going to like that. Well, and your book in and of itself is interesting because we don't, at least I don't seem to notice that there are a lot of memoirs from the tech space, especially from tech leaders like yourself. We usually end up with like biographies or whatnot after the fact. But what, what drew you to writing and putting together a memoir? Uh, I. I write all the time. Uh, it was more the fact that I was uh, very much encouraged to publish the the stories, and and it's it's a collection of stories um, that, in and of itself, they're, they're fun stories, uh, regardless of the fact that I'm in all of them. Uh, sometimes <laughs> an active uh, participant, sometimes just an observer, um, and I just um, these are stories that. Uh, I keep telling at parties or with friends and so forth. Uh, so I just figured they're, they're good stories. Uh, I'll write them down. And, um, and uh, one thing led to the other. And, and uh, I, I used to read the stories now, uh, the written stories here and there. And people are like, you know, you should publish this. This is really cool, fun. And a lot of folks, especially in my AR uh, technology sphere, uh, did not know uh, my background of having um, grown up and lived in pre and post revolutionary Iran during the war, actually served in the military a couple of times um, <laughs> in the Air Force and and the police force. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of colorful uh, side of me that I uh, that, that um, you know, doesn't come up when you're talking about, you know, inventing technology and so forth. So. So it sounds like it kind of happened where your friends were like, oh, here comes Baba talking his stories again. And then they were like, why don't you just write a book? <laughs> a little bit like that. I was also bored myself of having to repeat the stories over and over again. And, <laughs> and you know, every time you tell them, you kind of embellish them a little bit and they're a little different every time. My, my, my 
kids and my wife would kind of roll their eyes every time going, Oh my God, you changed it again. I'm like, yeah, but it's better now. Um, <laughs> so now I'm, fi I figured, you know, I'm done. I've written them down. So they're, it's just one version. And I just, I can, you know, if I go to a party, I'll just point at, you know, go read chapter number four and you know, that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You say that about the stories being embellished and changed over time, because I've always heard that about history because I also heard of a project once to and i don't know where it's at at this point because i kind of lost track of it using ai to document history because mm -hmm. humans yes as storytellers we do not tell the same story twice we it's yeah, just not within you know, our nature <laughs> I, I i and i can see why because usually everything we remember and everything we uh say about the past is is i mean the story trumps the reality that's mm -hmm. typically what happens uh, you know, why ruin a good story by, you know, making sure that everything is true about it. That's journalism, obviously. <laughs> right. But yes. uh, but I think it creeps in, even in journalism. You know, sometimes you see, like, I have a friend who's a documentary filmmaker, and um, he goes out and he gets tons and tons of footage, and it's up to him how he shows it. Like, the way this he sequences, it's all real, but the way he sequences it makes a complete difference as to how this what story he's telling and how he's telling it so yeah i think it's in the eye of the beholder isn't it right exactly mm -hmm. um and the name of the memoir we we didn't even mention it it's the conar yeah, it's, and the uh, apple exactly i got a copy right here the conar and the apple uh and that's me right here <laughs> and i've been i've been reading through it i haven't finished yet i have to admit because i did i got a little slowed down because i can read pretty quickly um, but I got slowed down when you start talking about war because I, I, I hate war. And then to think, mm. um, you were a, a kid when that all unfolded. Yeah. Yeah. The 13th year of my life was the worst. Yeah. And that's when the war started. And I can tell you, um, uh, Part of the story is about how, you know, we wake up one morning before that it's all like air raids and on a schedule almost and, and, and laughably uh, poor aiming by the Iraqis. Uh, and then one morning we wake up and it's mortar and mortar is very different. It's just nonstop and uh, very, very scary. Um, and uh, we turn on the radio the night before my parents had started thinking about, oh, you know, we're going to set up uh, some sort of like... Um, uh center to help folks like our soldiers coming back from the front and stuff like that and then we turn on the radio and the mayor is talking about you know here's how you uh will defend our city uh, people of Avaz. you're going to use your here's we're going to teach you how to make uh, molotov cocktails and that's the scariest thing ever because, you know, suddenly you're thinking, oh, OK, we are the front line. <laughs> there's no I mean, it's bad enough for adults. But as a kid, I couldn't I couldn't imagine I'm 12, 13 yeah. years old. That's the last thing. I. It's yeah, it's very, very, very scary. And it doesn't help even being there with other friends. And it's just, you know, it, it becomes very personal and myopic. You know, you want yeah. just to, to survive it recently. A friend of mine who, who um, read the book reached out and said he heard that in Ukraine, uh, a mayor was teaching their citizens how to make Molotov cocktails because the Russians come. So, you know, history repeats itself. This was, you know, 40 years ago and now it's happening all over again. So it's not remote history. <laughs> and that's one of the most upsetting things to me about humans in general, what you just said. We, we keep repeating the same stupidity. Uh, I like to watch this show called uh, Mysteries of the Abandoned. Mm. And one time I was watching with my youngest, he was about 12 at the time. And he even pointed out, why is it that everything is, revolves around war? They build all this stuff. And it's kind of disappointing to think that mankind, some of our greatest technological achievements will be devices that we've created to kill ourselves. It's disturbing. I'm like, what? It is. It is. It's, it's, it's amazingly absurd and stupid and silly. I mean, we lived through eight years of war. I lived through eight years of war. And you'd think that, you know, when it's all over, people would be rejoicing. It happens rarely. I guess it happened in the Second World War, uh, you know, 
But at the end of the Iran-Iraq war, people were just walking around thinking, why? I mean, what was this all about? Why? And I bet it's the same. Same's going to happen with Ukraine and Russia. They're going to, it's going to be a war of attrition at the end. They're yeah. just going to look at each other and go, why did we even do this stupid thing? You know? For a swath of land. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, moving on though, somehow you ended up in Idaho. What, how did this work? <laughs> I mean, of all the places, um, I guess we could say that about any state, but Idaho. Um. Yeah. Well, I thought that was the center of the universe. And we, <laughs> my, my, uh, my father was a, uh, university professor and, uh, he was, um, on sabbatical every few years. So we ended up in Idaho as one of his sabbaticals, uh, at the university of Idaho in Moscow. And, um, uh, I thought Moscow was in Idaho. I mean, when, when people said Moscow was in Russia, I'd just look at them and go, you're crazy. Moscow is in Idaho. So <laughs> yeah, to Idaho. me, it was the center of the world. Uh, I was little though. That was, that was right. years ago. Um, uh, we, we did go to London for a year. Uh, I was born in London before that. So every once in a while, my dad would be um, someplace. <laughs> and you may be surprised to know there's a Moscow in Ohio as well, where I'm at. Is there? Oh, okay. Yes, there's All a right. Moscow, Ohio too. I think okay, these awesome. names, they get repeated everywhere. So They <laughs> do. I've heard there's many like Lebanons all over in every state base, basically. Yeah. So Yes, there's a cool. Lebanon here in Ohio, right outside <laughs> of Cincinnati. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also a London, Ohio too. So London, yeah, these names yes. just get repeated. I, I uh, you know, I live in Dublin in California. And, uh, you know, when I flew around, I, I, I do a lot of business trips and people would ask me, where are you from? I'm like, I'm, I'm from Dublin, the real Dublin, the one in, in California as a joke, right. that joke did not land in Shannon airport in Ireland. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'd imagine like, not. The real Dublin is right here in <laughs> Ireland, daddy. No, exactly. Um, so then at some point the tech bug bit you. When did that happen? And what, what started you into it? Yeah, I mean, uh, from, from childhood, I like to uh, take things apart. I didn't particularly like putting them back together again. So I got into trouble a lot with my Same. parents and my grandparents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there we go. Uh, I think that was the start of it. I just wanted to figure things out. Um, I, I do remember going to uh, the Science Museum in London uh, when my dad worked at the Natural History Museum in London, it was creepy crawlies and insects, and it was boring to me. Uh, so I would just wander around that area and go to the Science Museum. I think on the sixth floor, they had this uh, showcase, The Future, and you walked up and there was a computer. It was a huge thing. It was like a wall of lights and stuff. And you, can, you could just uh, interact with it. And I, I was fascinated by it. And also, it... I got the bug to figure the computer out. And that was uh, when I was 11. Uh, many years later, um, after the entrance exam in Iran to get into university, uh, yeah, computer games and figuring out the computer was the driver behind me wanting to be a software engineer. And then later um, figuring out the brain got me into AI and figuring out life itself got me into artificial life. So it's it's been sort of a trajectory of trying to figure things out. <laughs> I, the same. I, I often tell people what got me into tech was just my natural curiosity about things in general. Um, yeah. You know, mine it started in the 80s. I've told the story a thousand times, jumped in with a TRS-80 Coco, there learned basic programming, and then just from there. I started with basic as well, basic and Pascal. I taught myself basic, yeah. Yeah. It was, those were fun times. They were simpler yeah. times. <laughs> they were. That is they true. They were much that simpler times. <laughs> Well, one of the main reasons why I wanted you to have one, and as you see the title of this episode, Foundations of AI, um, I feel that as of late, there's just been a lot of chatter about AI. And I feel a lot of it may be missing the mark as to what AI actually is and what it's used for. Because I do see a lot of marketing speak that kind of drives me crazy. So... If you could have a somewhat of a cursory definition of AI, artificial and artificial intelligence, what would you say it is? Um, th there could be many correct definitions, uh, and I'll give you a few. Um, to me, an AI system is a system where we pose the problem and it comes up with the solution, unlike programming, where 
uh, you know, we kind of have the end to end, the A to Z of, you know, here's what's going to happen. If then do this, if this, then do that, you know, you kind of have it all planned out in an AI system. You um, basically say, here's, here's the problem. And the system goes off and, and solves it. So that's one definition. Another definition could be that it is all the facilities as humans that we use to solve problems, uh, to learn our environment and act and decide in our environment. What are these various different facets? Can we actually replicate them in our machinery uh, and put them together? Uh, there's another definition uh, for strong AI is to actually be able to mimic uh, how, you know, all of the general AI that, uh, sorry, general intelligence that humans exhibit in machinery. So they can all be correct. Um, uh, for me, uh, again, in the same uh, spirit of figuring things out, uh, I'd like to know what is it, what are the constituents of intelligence? And you can talk about learning, you can talk about creativity, you can talk about um, decision making, intuition emotions, you know, there are many constituents. Uh, how do they operate? How do they act together? And can we, uh, can we create a system like that? It doesn't have to use the very same technology or very same uh, functionality and methods uh, as we observe in humans. I had a professor that said, we know how to create humans already. That's not, that's not interesting. It, what's interesting is to create machinery that exhibits the same kind of uh, functionality. I'm, I'm going to try to remember that. We already know how to make humans. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. So as far as the marketing speak, I, I just want to vent a little bit about some of the stuff that I see. For example, I often see things advertised as, okay, you have a webcam. Webcams have been around for many years. There are some great quality webcams. They have autofocus, you know, different settings. You can change color gradients and all that. And then suddenly the flip, the switch was flipped to now so many are marketed as AI powered webcam. My first line of question is what would serve a webcam to be AI powered? <laughs> what, what good is that doing? And when you get these things and you see the marketing, it's, it's just a webcam that's doing autofocus zoom, the same things I just described. That sort of marketing drives me crazy because I think part of it, they get to get away with it because we can't prove that it's not AI powered, if that makes any sense. No, that's that makes total sense. Marketing um, AI, AI has very strong hype value when it's in vogue. And AI has gone through multiple springs and winters, unfortunately. We're in the, I think I would say fourth spring of AI, and we might end up in another winter because of the overhype and the expectation that is produced. Um, there's a reason why we are in a hype cycle with AI, because there have been some fundamental and amazing breakthroughs uh, in artificial intelligence, um, many of which have been in the area of uh, being able to recognize and do image processing, for example, or voice processing. And so if there's any trace of that sort of thing in that camera, people take the liberty to call it AI uh, powered. Uh, but for us, AI has a different meaning, doesn't it? I mean, we, we kind of think like there's some sort of brain in there. Um, I think by one of the definitions of AI that I mentioned, which is posing the problem to it and having it solve it, uh, it may be that that webcam does have AI because nobody taught it how to uh, zoom and autofocus. Uh, the focus that it does is based on having seen many examples of how to focus and then abstracting that to uh, instances that it's never seen before. And that in itself is, is quite interesting. But it's only a very small sliver of what we expect from an AI system. And if our definition is more general, then totally we expect much more from a webcam if, that's what it is maybe that's uh, maybe that's what it is i maybe i keep putting it up on a pedestal and when people say oh this car you're stereo right, is ai powered what <laughs> no <laughs> you, you're totally right i mean in many cases it doesn't even deserve to be called ai and it's often a rebranding of statistics based modeling uh, approaches that is 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 called ai based systems in many cases it's just machine learning and not necessarily AI. AI 
does we we do need to uh, have a higher standard for AI than just autofocus and then webcam. I'm totally with you on that. And who would you say would should be the uh, the gatekeepers of those standards? Because it feels like it's to the point where anyone could just say, "Oh, this is AI," or "That's AI." Should there be some sort of standardization body or some sort of regulation or? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, I think it'll even itself out. I think after a while, um, unfortunately, what will happen is that a lot of the hype will, um, will, uh, 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 the, the expectation is not going to be met. Uh, if you, if you, if you go out and buy an AI based webcam, you have a high expectation for it being smart. And if it's not, then, then that's unmet expectation. And what happens is that people will start avoiding to use that kind of terminology, sometimes to its de detriment. Uh, there was a time when uh, uh, just recently, in 2007, there was a book published about the future. This, this was a book by a technologist talking about all the really cool stuff that is going to happen in the future. There's not a single mention of AI and intelligent systems in that book. Mm. This is 2007. Why? Because we were in a winter of AI where unmet expectations met, meant, you know, if you talk about AI, it's just overhyping something that just can't happen. That was just a few, few short years before now this hype cycle where everything is labeled as AI. I, it's unfortunate, but that's kind of the way uh, AI uh, kind of unfolds itself. Um, uh, you, we will end up having deep networks and neural networks in a lot of places. We already do for speech recognition, for mm -hmm. machine translation. They've displaced the state of the art. Um, uh, soon in editing video uh, and, um, and all that. And I think um, the only thing that's going to happen is people are not going to call it AI anymore. Uh, I think the trajectory of progress in science and technology is not going to be hampered by it other than the fact that maybe investment is going to be uh, hard to get if you label what you're working on as AI. So we always have other names for what we're doing. That's where we should be fine. <laughs> well, that, that's good because yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. The investors will back off because oh, they'll yeah. see that people are like, this is just a gimmick. You guys are just yeah. saying stuff. We're not going to put any money in it. Um, and yeah. as far as the speech, now you're credited for the the natural speech, natural uh, language, yes. natural language foundation. Now it's, it's important that people know you didn't invent Siri, nope. but you were part of, well, can you just explain what it was that you did and how it's used? Yeah. Uh, my team and I came up with the natural language technology that then ended up being the basis for the original Siri. And actually most of my team ended up starting Siri, but I was not officially part of the Siri team. Um, yeah, I started a company called Dejima back in uh, 98, where a lot of that technology was built. Uh, in some respects, we were a little early to the market and speech recognition, which pairs with natural language. So speech recognition is transcribing the uh, waveform into text. And natural language is understanding that text. It's, in my opinion, the harder part of, of the deal. So that part uh, is what we uh, invented and implemented as part of Dejima, and then later on became uh, the core for Siri. Um, and it was a breakthrough, a huge breakthrough at the time. Yeah. That is hard. I don't, I don't even, I don't try to claim to understand how it eventually got worked out. Because when you look at it now, even with uh, like Google's assistant and even Alexa, the, where it's at now, how those things can actually understand what you're saying, as well as what someone else is saying. If you're both saying the same things, again, as humans, we say things and do things differently, even though we're that's doing true. the same thing. And the fact mm -hmm. that they can recognize that, well, they're asking me the same question. That's amazing to me. Absolutely. And and the, the main breakthrough back then was before we, we uh, came up with our invention, you, um, these systems were brittle they had to be very grammatical uh, and they were very language centric. So if you built a system for English, uh, then, you know, building that same system in French or in Persian or some other language would be very, very difficult. It would basically mean re-engineering the whole thing. But our main invention was that we went from the ontology, so the concepts itself, uh, and uh, the system was based on the concepts that drive what you're uh, communicating with. 
be it, you know, changing the channel on TV or, you know, looking up weather or, you know, uh, the meaning of life as Siri <laughs> would answer you. Um, so that's, that's, that was the main breakthrough back then. And, and uh, what it, it kind of liberated uh, us to be able to make systems that are, you know, you, uh, uh, robust and flexible to various different ways of communicating with them. And that leads me into the next point where we always hear the negative chatter about data gathering and eventually what's going to happen with all of that and how maybe one day the machines will take over. Um, and I try to talk people down off of the ledge when it comes to, to data gathering because I'm from, again, from the era where we were originally taught, don't forget, computers are initially stupid. They only do what you tell them to do. So I try to tell people that all the time, you know, people freak out. I was just looking at something or talking to someone. The next thing I know, I get this Amazon suggestion <laughs> to go buy it. And I tell them it, it's just doing what you're telling it to do. It knew that you had an interest in that. So people freak out. Um, do, but do you think that maybe that all has possibly gotten out of control or is it just that it wasn't the messaging wasn't properly conveyed to people as to how these systems work and that it's not magic. It, it needs you to tell it something. Yeah. I mean, clearly it's not magic. And in those cases, those instances that you mentioned, this is uh, very much engineered and programmed. Um, but a lot of data is being collected on, on us. And um, you know, we do need regulation uh, fortunately, Europe is kind of on the forefront of that, and that kind of pushes other um, geographies to to follow uh, in order to make sure that bad actors don't uh, don't make use of this data. So that's one track, and it has more to do with technology and, and engineered systems that might uh, abuse uh, the data that they that is collected. Um, Part of that also is because of the business models out there. These are, you know, free to you, uh, but in exchange, it's your data that's being sold around, and so they can they can market. Nothing you. is free. It, nothing is free. <laughs> Remember though that if the ad annoys you, that means the system hasn't worked properly. An ad is only an ad, annoying ad, if what is marketed to you is annoying. But if it hits you at the right time when you actually need it. It's not an ad anymore. It's oh cool, I want that, you know. Yeah. And so that's that's where intelligence might be able to help. So that's one track. The other is the fact that a lot of our machine learning based AI systems are trained on these data sets to find patterns that we don't engineer. So remember, I said a lot of it, AI can be defined as I'll pose the problem, you come up with the solution. If that solution is black box, in other words, we can't read and understand what it is, it's just a bunch of numbers and, and neural network, then um, it might be keying off of patterns that we would not like it to key off of, such as the color of our skins or our ethnicity or our age and or, or gender, whatever, right? So, so uh, it's very, very difficult to control these systems, not to have that kind of bias. Part of the reason why it's difficult is because we don't have a very good definition for what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Uh, and my hope is uh, the silver lining in all of this is that we are forced to come up with unambiguous, clear definitions of what we believe is bias what is ethically incorrect versus ethically acceptable. And we build it into our systems, those safeguards. The human element is always going to be the problem. <laughs> right. Always, because you're always going to have, for example, you're always going to have a black person that says, I can't believe it did this because just because I'm black, but then you'll have another black person that says, why doesn't show me it show me more black people stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. like the human element will always throw a monkey wrench in everything. That's Just right. I, I, I totally agree with you. And as you know, humanity has grown used to defining what's acceptable and not acceptable ambiguously. And it's always after the fact that we right. hold someone responsible for doing something unethical 
and not always, but many, many, in many instances, right? And, um, you know, we, we no longer have the luxury of doing that uh, because we can't hold an AI responsible. We have to be very clear uh, about what is acceptable and what is not. So moving on into the future, what would a future with AI, what would you say would be a, a much better future with AI? Because we do know that there's lots of helpful, helpful applications in medical, uh, medical science, uh, even business. So what would you say is if the future of AI could look like this, things would not be so bad. Yeah, I mean, what, a, a, a track that I am suing and, and think is very encouraging is in AI helping us with our decision making. And it always it already is in many cases helping us with our decision making where the decision making is clearly already automatable. Um, and, you know, if you look at, for example, an organization at the leaf nodes of that organization are things that we can automate. and are being automated such as you know the supply chain or you know the demand part or the sales part and stuff like that um, where we are lacking and i think in the future we should be looking at is going up these organizations not just in companies but also in society where um, very impactful decisions are being made by by fallible humans uh, that that impact everything uh, and they're they're really not answerable. They're typically not data oriented. They're based on gut feeling and, and bias and ideology and all sorts of things. And I think they could be augmented and in some cases even replaced by data oriented decision making systems. And I think my guess is the world will be a better place if we can start moving up the chain and augment decision making uh, in that manner. Um, we had a very good example of that with the pandemic recently, where uh, decision making with respect to controlling the pandemic became this hideously political thing, uh, where it shouldn't have been. Right. And um, and the reason for that is because the decision makers that were responsible for safeguarding society uh, were humans of different you know, biases. One is a Republican, one is a d Democrat, one thinks this way. And then some, suddenly something as trivial as wearing a mask became political. Um, and uh, when you looked at it, the division was based on a false division. Like one side was like, we have to save lives. And one side was saying, we have to save the economy. And that's a false choice. We have to save both. And it's an AI system that can find the best balance for decisions that can optimize and improve both the savior of, of uh, uh, you know, human lives, as well as make sure that the impact on the economy is minimized. And that's based on the data that's collected. So if we had an AI-based system that could help us with that sort of decision-making, we wouldn't be in a predicament where some countries really, really suffered and some, I mean, both, both suffered a lot either from economic loss or from loss of human lives. And that balance between them was not struck because of this polarization in the decision-making, which is very, very human. Um, just one example, but there are many. I'd swear to you, I was screaming at the television during that whole thing. I was saying the exact same thing. They're both right, Yeah. but that's not the point. I, that was my thing. I'm like, that's really not the, the, the point here, who's right, and that's what it became a shouting match of who's right and who's wrong. Exactly. Again, like I said, the human element will always <laughs> throw a monkey wrench in everything. That's right. And also moving on into the future, because we always hear this and it's always usually a lot of science fiction. Do you ever have fears of AI becoming sentient or robots taking over? Well, my last startup was called sentient. Um, <laughs> not, not really. I, I, I think, uh, I, I welcome it. It's, I mean, we're, we're pretty lonely in this world being the only sentient beings <laughs> for our own definition. Right. Um, but no, I, I actually think that, uh, I mean, even last week there was this big news uh, with, with certain folks out of Google believing that their latest uh, huge, you know, transformer based AI uh, system is showing signs of sentience. 
Um, I don't I don't quite believe it. I don't I don't think the approach that they're taking would would lead to that sort of intelligence, but it will um, manifest certain uh, uh, sort of uh, behavior that will will seem uh, sentient, uh, which is all great. I, I, I think that um, uh, as long as we don't forget to put the off switch uh, <laughs> on our, on right. our systems. I think we'll be fine. And uh, yeah, I think we can use some help. Uh, we, we think we're very intelligent and we think that our intelligence is, is helping us uh, in this world. And I, I think that's really, we're too full of ourselves thinking that. I, I really think we need help with, uh, with how we act in, in the world and we're at our capacity uh, and um, you know, some augmentation of our intelligence is in order now. And that should be the purpose of technology to help enhance human life, never to replace it. That's the definition of humanity is extending ourselves with our tools. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Now you've mentioned a couple of startups. I did want to touch on that a bit. You being a serial entrepreneur, I did listen to a podcast where you mentioned you kind of accidentally fell into entrepreneurship. How did that happen? <laughs> yes. I uh, was working on my PhD, deciding, trying to decide how I can uh, use the power of AI in the lab that I had seen. I, I, I felt it. I, I felt like it's very, very powerful, and I want to bring it to the world in some uh, applied capacity. I was looking for various different use cases. Uh, at, at lunch uh, one day, a, um, a friend of mine uh, asked me about the technology, and I mentioned it's agent-oriented. Back then, distributed AI-based systems were called agent-oriented systems. And I said, yeah, there's this agent-oriented system. Uh, and in my definition, an agent was basically this idiot savant that um, worked in conjunction with other idiot savants that were all programmed, and the emergent behavior was to solve a problem. So that's the way I was thinking about it. it turns out in his head, he was thinking of an agent as being you know, a representative of a human. And uh, he came back shortly thereafter, maybe a couple of days after, and he said, Bobak, we're going to start a company. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and he said that it's, this is, uh, I had this um, uh, great idea. I was at a bar and uh, this mama-san, we were in Japan at the time, uh, this mama-san in the, in the bar was trying to change the channel to tennis. I couldn't just figure it out. So he asked his son, her son, to change the channel and the sun changed the channel and that's going to be the basis for our company. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah, that we're going to replace that sun with an intelligent agent so that you can actually talk to it and it can change the channel for you. You don't even uh, have to know the name of the channel. You just say, you know, give me Wimbledon and it'll change to it. And it was a misunderstanding as to what the meaning of agent is. Uh, and so I kind of made fun of him and I said, you know, natural language is really, really hard and we shouldn't, even be thinking about that and we should be looking at a more practical application. And he turned to me and said, if you really think that your AI is powerful, uh, you know, why not apply it to something that others have, have not? Um, and so that was a challenge I, I took to heart. I worked on it over a weekend and, and kind of thought about how I would actually tackle natural language with, with an Asian based system. And I came back, talked to my professor, one thing led to another, and next thing you know, uh, you know, we had tickets to uh, to uh, San Francisco um, to see if we can raise money. And I, I, that's when I met my good friend Adam Chire, who is actually the, the founder of, of Siri. Uh, and I ran my idea by him, and he's like, "Yeah, I think you can do it." Uh, so we got some um, good encouragement from the technology side, some good encouragement from uh, the uh, investment side one thing led to the other and we started the company i it was really not something i was planning to do <laughs> kind of just happened so if you think back on it now where would you had a thought that would have went using your definition of agent you know Did you'll you laugh even at think this of... back, oh yeah back then i was thinking I'm, I'm a big soccer fanatic and i was thinking you know there was a new tournament that had just started called robo cup and it was the equivalent of the World Cup, but with robots playing soccer. And I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to go <laughs> kick some butt there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my agents to win the soccer robot World Cup. So, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad I didn't do that, although it would have been well, fun. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been fun, but yeah. <laughs> it would have been fun. That, that's awesome. Um, so what do you have coming up? Um, any future plans? 
that you could talk to us about or uh, anything yeah you could share? so right now i'm i'm very much pursuing the ai based decision making track uh, we've made really really good progress that system that i just mentioned with respect to making decisions uh, regarding the pandemic um, you know, in May of 2020, we had that system up and running, an AI-based system that would give recommendations regionally uh, to uh, epidemics um, uh, folks. Um, and uh, it actually got used by a few regions around the world, uh, and we did an XPRIZE on that. So I'm expanding, I'm working with my team to expand uh, the use of that sort of technology and other uh, decision augmentation uh, systems. And um, on the research side, I'm continuing to work on uh, artificial life related um, research, which is very much research. It's not going to be practical anytime soon. But... <laughs> More soccer stuff or no, I'm just... <laughs> watching a lot of soccer. <laughs> watching and very lot happy of... with where Liverpool is these days. I'm a big <laughs> Liverpool fan. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I could go on for hours, but I don't want to you know, I don't want to take up much of your time, but I do want to thank you once again for coming on. Um, I will finish the book. Like I said, the, the, the whole war part slowed me down a lot. I can't, you know, my emotions take over and I'm like, I, I got to just get through this. <laughs> I hope you like it. Yeah, I, there's there's much more um, uh, good stories in there, too. So hopefully, hopefully you like it and, and let me know how, how you feel. And uh, thank you so much again for having me on your show. It's really Absolutely. Uh, and you're welcome back anytime. Where can people uh, purchase the book? Uh, yes. So the book, The Konar and the Apple, just uh, Google it. It's on um, Amazon. Uh, there's a, an audio book that I read myself. Uh, there is also an ebook and, um, you know, the hard, hard copy. Uh, it's on Amazon and um Barnes and Noble, a lot of places. So uh, hopefully you like it. Uh, it's been getting some good reviews. And, uh, um, you know, uh, you can also reach me on Twitter at Bob Eck at work. Um, let me know what you think about the book. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you once again, Bob, for coming on. And as always, for those listening, if you want to get a hold of me and find out all the places you can listen to the show, just go to voluntaryinput.com. You can find all of our past episodes and again, all the different places you can listen. There's also a contact form there. If you have any questions, comments, or show ideas, or better yet, if you'd like to be a guest, just select register as a guest because we're always looking for great guests like you. Well, sir, once again, I want to thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Same to you. All right. Take care. Yeah.